Okay, John speaking, wonderful. Thank you for that. All right. Anyhow, the reason um, it's going to be recording today, we're going to head and add that to the MDE LIO video library on the website there. If you do have any questions that you may have during um, this live webinar today, those questions can be added to the Q&A feature. And that Q&A feature is located at the, it's within your Zoom controls. And questions are anonymous. And those questions will be read by the event host, my colleague, Johanna and Caitlin. They will go ahead and take a look at those and monitor those as they come in. And then those who are requesting professional development credits when you joined today, we will verify your attendance. And that will be for with, I should say, an attendee timestamp. And if your attendance is verified and you requested sketches, then you will receive an email from MDELIO at the end of this webinar series in April. And that series will include the information on how to receive those credits. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, first we'd like to discuss the accessibility check. Uh, before we do proceed with today's event, we wanna make sure that everybody's accessibility needs are met. Uh, that is of course a priority today. Captioning is available for this webinar. To turn on the captioning, you'll want to click Show Captions, and that is a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You might need to click on More if you don't see it right away. Click on More and it should come up. We also have ASL interpreters today on today's webinar. If you need to see them more clearly, please click View in the top Again, click view in the top right-hand corner. And then select gallery view. And then select hide non-video participants. Additionally, we'd like to ask everyone to turn their videos off so that only the presenter and the interpreter's visible videos are visible. And lastly, you can adjust your video layout on your Zoom screen by hovering over the faint line that separates the video from the shared screen and moving it left or right. If you need any technical, technical assistance during this call today, please message John, interpreter correction, Caitlin or Johanna, and because they are available, message them privately via chat and they can assist you with any technical challenges you may have. All right, we are all set. Let's go ahead and dive in today to our presentation. Today, the learner objectives and agendas are as follows. It's on your screen. The participants, um, I should say, today's learner objectives are listed on the screen. We're excited to offer this um, opportunity to explore the topic of supporting transition needs in high school and beyond. And today I am thrilled to introduce our two guest presenters we have today. Please do welcome Jennifer Hurst and Claudette Reed. And they will explain their roles and their experiences. And I will at this time hand it over to you, Jennifer and Claudette, you are up. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, John, for the introduction and for inviting us today to be a part of your series and talking about Michigan Rehabilitation Services and how we can support the students who are deaf and hard of hearing and, you know, from transition and beyond. Um, I am, like John said, I am with Michigan Rehabilitation Services. I am the statewide transition consultant. So really what that means is I have my fingers in about everything that includes our students from age 14 to 26 in providing pre-employment transition services and going into our individualized transition services once they have a plan established for services. 
Claudette, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Claudette Reed. What I am the. Him? What happened to his oxy oxygen tank? I am the assistive technology consultant within the business network division of Michigan Rehab Services. This is the division that supports the counselors in the district offices, providing services for the individuals with disabilities across the state, as well as working with businesses who are looking to hire or have hired people with disabilities. Um, also, I am an occupational therapist and have been working with the agency for over 24 years. Jennifer? Yes, thank you so much, Claudette. Um, next slide, please. So like I said, um, what we're gonna be doing today is we're going to be describing the services of MRS and what it can look like for our individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. We're also going to identify the resources that MRS may provide to families and professionals and explain the process on how to obtain the services from MRS. Next slide. So you heard me mentioned we are starting services at age 14. And so really what we're looking at is what is those services that the individual needs? And so one of the um, first levels that our students can start participating in is the pre-employment transition services. These services are designed to be early on, like I said, at age 14, and they're gonna start exploring what those job interests are. In addition, this assists the students in identifying their careers. As we know, students struggle with knowing what it is that they wanna do. So getting these pre ed services in line at an earlier age can start informing them of the job opportunities that are out there in their area, what maybe the training opportunities are, and then also to just having those conversations and realizing what is out there. We know when we are working with students, they might say, I wanna do what my parent is doing, or I wanna do what grandpa's doing, or my cousins or nieces and uncles or whomever that they have in their family, because that's what they're used to. But if we explore them to other interests, they can open up their eyes in being able to see what is also out there for them. Once they identify a somewhat a career path, then we can start going into that level two of services, what we call the individualized vocational rehabilitation services. These, this is designed to be that next step toward that job and career interest, really outlining what are the supports and services that are needed to be successful, outlining that training plan, if there is a training plan, if it's going you know, to a vocational school, if it's going to a community college, a university, an apprenticeship, or anything straight into that employment. These are really individualized for that individual. Sometimes we might have, you know, some same services identified if you know someone else, but really it's going to be tailored to the supports and the services leading to that competitive integrated employment for that individual to be successful in whatever career path that they choose. Next step, or excuse me, next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about the job exploration services, those pre ets These are the five categories that we can authorize to support the students in exploring those services. Remember, these are short-term in nature. They can start at age 14 and all the way up till 26, as long as they are identified as a student with a disability in a registered educational institution. Um, so really what we're doing is we're doing those job exploration counseling, looking at those different jobs, considering those job interests, looking at the skills to be successful in that. We can also look at providing work-based learning experiences. So these participants, you know, are participating in activities that learn about the, the workplace. 
getting that workplace exposure, interacting with employees, learning you know those skills along the way. We also can provide the counseling and post-secondary education. Teach, learning for, excuse me, having those participants learn what are those options out there in the education after and being able to be trained in the, the employment goal that they wanna do. Workplace readiness skills. This is to gain those skills to be ready for employment. So sometimes we're working on communication skills, self-advocacy skills as in two with that um, fifth category that we have. So there's a lot of different things that, you know, we can provide depending on what these services are. But keep in mind too, some of the things that the students are receiving are also in all these different categories. So even though we're outlining there's these five different categories that we can authorize, they do, uh, you know, melt together and we, you know, are constantly growing and teaching those students what those skills are to assist them. And remember, these are short term in nature and they're just focused on exploratory. So giving them the information and then providing what can assist them. Next slide, please. So how can we get started with pre -ets? As I identified, we have two different levels. So to get started with the first level of pre -ets, we need to have a parent or guardian, a school staff member, or an other professional contact MRS. You can contact the office directly. You can talk, um, contact the um, our website, and I will give that, that information at the end of the slide if you are un unsure of who that contact person is. We just have to have an active individualized education plan or an IEP or an active 504 plan or a post-secondary enrollment verification. This is showing us that that potentially eligible student is actually a, a student with a disability and receiving services. Then we just need to have the student and youth meet with the MRS counselor to complete the pre agreement to begin that career exploration and work readiness services. That is outlining, that's the plan of the services that that student may need. Remember, everything that we are providing is going to be individualized on the services that the student needs and what those expectations are. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about the level two, the individualized vocational rehabilitation services. This is one that unfortunately we do have to have another application filled out. Hopefully we are working towards having a different system put in place, but this is meant to coordinate with the students to plan for that career. So we're exploring under Priets, now we're planning for that career and we're really individualizing those services and outlining what it is that that individual needs to have those supports to be successful. And it may also too include, but not limited to any of those five pre yet services. So think of, you know, you got your five pre yet services that you can utilize, but then you can also move over to the individualized services. And as long as you meet that um, student with a disability, you can also to get those extra services. So how, next slide please. So how do we start with VR? Like I said, there is a, another application for participants to include, but the biggest thing that is different with having the individualized services is we want to have that medical documentation to establish the eligibility. Um, you, if you wanna click it for the next. So when, thank you. I, if you wanna go ahead and click all those, those it's fine. Um, so when we're looking at establishing the eligibility, to um, have services, we're looking at the individual as having a physical or a mental impairment 
some type a um, substantial independent impediment to employment. So we're we're looking at what are those services to achieve employment, and what is the outcome consistent with their abilities and capabilities. Are they able to benefit for services in terms of the employment outcome? So just really think of, you know, when we're gathering the medical documentation, our counselors are looking at these four different categories and establishing that eligibility. So when we're working on establishing the eligibility, we're also looking at what are those services that the individual is going to need to be successful in that employment goal. So once our participants have been found eligible for services, we then move on to our next level of creating that plan for employment. So next slide, please. So when we're creating that plan for employment, again, we are looking at it to be individualized. What are those services that the individual needs to be successful? Do they need pre-ETS? Have they received pre-ETS? What are their limitations? What are some things that we can put in place for them to be successful in their career path? So on this slide, you will see just a little bit of um, services that I put on here. Now, this is not limited to the services. This is just more of a generalized look at what those services are. Because again, um, I know I keep saying this, but it is always going to be individualized. So when our counselors are working with our individuals, our number one service is providing that vocational guidance and counseling and really looking at what is it that the individual needs. We look at those transition services. What needs to be provided for this individual to be successful? Again, it can you know, be meeting with teachers. It could be you know, providing services in school. It can um, really outlining the transition plan with the IEP. So that's one of those biggest things that we wanna make sure that we are a part of is when we're establishing the IEP, the Individualized Education Plan, we also want to be establishing the Individualized Plan for Employment, which those two you know, are really confusing when we're talking about it because IEP and IPE. So just kind of think of those when we're talking about transition services. We're also going to be looking at those supports upon graduation. How can we assist that individual in college, job training? What is it that they need? In addition, what um, we can assist with that job placement and retention services, getting them ready for that employment, being that support system. And then when they receive that employment opportunity, we want them to keep that job. So what is that retention going to look like? Having those natural supports put in place, uh, making sure that we are all on the same you know, page and making sure that the individual can be successful. As we know, sometimes management may change and then you know, the individual might have um, a risk of losing their job, which they always can come back to MRS and get those services if need be. And then also to looking at that rehabilitation technology. And that's some of the things that we are going to be able to talk about today on the individual basis. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Claudette. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. A large part of what I have been doing with Michigan Rehab Services over the years to help businesses and individuals with disabilities identify reasonable accommodations. Now, the word accommodation has many meanings in the English language. It can be temporary lodging or available space for occupants in a building, a vessel, or a vehicle. It can be the process of adapting or adjusting to someone or something. Um, but in the Americans with Disabilities Act, when it was passed in 1990, they utilized the term accommodations and they gave it a new legal definition. A reasonable accommodation is a modification or adjustment to a job, the work environment, or the way that things are usually done during the hiring process. 
it's defined by the U.S. Department of Justice as a change or adjustment to a job or work environment that permits a qualified applicant or employee with a disability to participate in the job application process, to perform the essential functions of the job, or to enjoy the benefits and privileges of employment equal to those enjoyed by employees without disabilities. So what makes an accommodation reasonable? Well, there's really two things. First, it must be effective. It allows the worker with a disability to perform the essential functions of the job at the same level of productivity and quality as other workers in the same job classification. It also cannot be an undue hardship on the business. And what that means is that a reasonable accommodation cannot substantially change the way that the work is completed. It can't put an undue financial burden on the business, and that's determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And it cannot provide a legitimate safety risk for the employee with a disability or for their coworkers. But other than that, anything could be an accommodation. So to identify an accommodation, you first have to understand what does the job require? Those are the essential functions and the functional limitations of the worker with a disability that prevents or limits the ability to do what the job requires. Next slide. So when a student is part of the K-12 educational system, the educational program is responsible for modifications needed in order for them to benefit from the educational program. And once a student has graduated and is employed, their employer has the responsibility to provide reasonable accommodations needed on the job to allow a qualified worker to perform the essential functions of the job. But the employer is not responsible for providing personal devices used on the job, such as wheelchairs or hearing aids. MRS can assist with personal supports that help someone to work. But in between school and work, MRS can provide reasonable accommodations that are necessary to benefit from the PREETS or MRS services. This is most often needed when a student is participating in job exploration or work-based learning activities actually in the workplace. Next slide. So rehabilitation technology is one of the MRS service classifications and the one that I focus on. These services may include things like vehicular modifications, telecommunications, sensory and other technological aids and devices. So how does rehab technology or assistive technology help your students? Click please. Tasks that are frequently required on the, oh, go back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tasks that are frequently required on the job, but may be a barrier for persons who are deaf or hard of hearing, include using a telephone, participating in meetings or other face-to-face -face communication, or using online resources for needing needed training or virtual meetings. Often students have personal listening devices, such as hearing aids compatibility with technology found on the job, such as telephones or online meeting platforms, may need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis because every person is different and every job has unique essential functions. Some possible accommodations include when you're talking about using a telephone, there are relay services and CapTel telephones, Bluetooth compatibility phone systems may work with some people who have Bluetooth compatible hearing aids. And the use of text-based communication, such as text messages and emails um, as a substitute for some telephone communication. When you're talking about meetings and face-to-face -face communication, there's a, a wide range of 
amplification devices, including looping meeting rooms and use of microphones um, for this person who is speaking, using table microphones when you have a group conversation. Now, CART transcription and ASL interpreters also are an important part of meetings and face-to-face -face communication. And online training, it's important to recognize that both closed captioning, the type of captioning that you turn on, or open captioning that's always there and available should be on all training materials. Real-time captioning of meetings using AI-based systems are something that uh, is used in Teams and on Zoom, um, and they're good, but they're not as good as having a transcriptionist actually um, work to be able to provide that um, transcription more accurately. And of course, American Sign Language Interpretation is also something that can be added to support online training. Written transcripts can be used after the meeting as a reference. Next slide. Here are a couple of devices that may be helpful for many of our clients who are deaf or hard of hearing. The first one is HandTalk, and this is a free app for iPhone and Android phones. It was developed in Brazil and has an avatar who signs messages in real time. Messages can be spoken or typed into it. If you click on the play button, we'll be able to watch a brief demo. Now, this, is, this kind of technology is still in a developmental phase. It's not perfect, but it is something that is available and can be a good um, option for some people for some small amounts of communication. Another device is the UbiDuo, um, and this is a typing-based communication aid that can be used to allow communication between persons who are deaf or hard of hearing and other communication partners. MRS has just purchased one of these devices for every MRS district office across the state so that all of our staff, the receptionists, the counselors, and others will have a means to communicate with our clients. And this won't eliminate the need for other supports such as CART or ASL interpreters, but it will be an additional method for communicating quickly. Identifying and providing the right supports to allow students to be successful with their transition from school to work is an important part of the service provided by Michigan Rehab Services. Jennifer will talk about that collaboration. Jennifer? Thank you, Claudette. So this is Jennifer again. So this slide that you are seeing that is being shared is talking about that collaborating for success. So we are talking about students with, with disabilities um, starting you know, in high school and beyond. So really when we are working with our students with disabilities, we are working with the LEAs. So they are wrapped around that student and providing that service in their local education agency. And inside that LEA system, there's also some additional supports that students are getting provided during that school day to be able to be successful in school. If you click it one more time, maybe just click the slide. There it goes. Um, so then when um, with the information that we are sharing today, not only is that student receiving their services from their LEA, their local education agency, we're also looking at services being provided to that student or students from Michigan Rehabilitation Services. Then we're looking at, you know, what is that, that community support network that that individual needs or has? And then we're also working with our business relation consultants, such as Claudette, and, and working on those services. So when we all come together and providing that service, those services to that student, 
we're really working for the student to be successful. We're really having those, um, the communications internally, because as you know, students, they, they change their minds. And so if we are connected with that student and understand that student's capabilities and abilities to be successful, we all can help them be successful. We also are leveraging those additional services that that student needs. We're looking at promoting that post-graduation employment and outcomes for students with disabilities. We're having them be successful in what it is that they want to do, not with what we want them to do or their parents or guardians that what they want to do, their teachers, their consultants, whomever is working with that student, they are having those services being provided to them for them to be successful. And then also too, we're being able to communicate with the same language and assisting those students. So next slide, please. So with that, um, we have um, some time for some questions. We, I feel like we blew through our, our time a little bit. So if there's any questions, um, comments or anything, this is definitely the time where you can ask. And I think I might see a couple in the Q&A. This is Caitlin. Yeah, there's one in the Q&A that I see. How current does the medical document have to be? So typically when we say about our medical, the medical documentation, less than five years old. Um, we want to make sure that everything is um, clear and documented. Sometimes if we cannot get documentation that is less than five years old, our counselors can then refer for assessments underneath those individualized services. So that's going to be that level two because we are establishing that eligibility. So when we do those referrals for additional assessments, it's going to look at that individual's, um, you know, those barriers and to make sure that we can establish the, the eligibility. So when we're talking about audiograms, we're going to be looking at, you know, what is the, the level of hearing um, with the, uh, the individual, the participant with hearing aids or um, being able to need an interpreter. Additionally, too, we're going to look at Sometimes we look at that cognitive ability, um, especially when we're looking at that employment goal. So we could also do a psych psychological, psychological evaluation for that individual to see where they're at for them to be successful in that employment. So it's going to be individualized depending on what that individual is coming in for and what they are stating their, their disability is. This is Caitlin again. Thank you. Um, the other question that John did answer in the Q&A was, could we get these slides sent to us? Um, he answered that we don't send copies of our presentation slides, but uh, we'll send a link to the recorded video and a list of any resources and links that were shared um, in a couple weeks. This is Caitlin again. I see uh, one other question that just came in. Do we include MRS services right in the IEP? What does that language sound like? Is it included in supplemental aids and services section? So, um, thank you. This is Jennifer. So when we are looking at the IEP with education, we do not have to be written in that IEP. So sometimes there might be some language put in there to, you know, show that partnership. So inviting the local MRS counselor to that IEP so they can, you know, have be a part of that transition plan or having those conversations. That is also too could be used as that referral component um, to, for us to provide that information and material to um, the, the student and the families about what MRS is and the opportunities that that student can get. So really it's not, you know, putting MRS 
within the IEP, but it's more that collaboration of, you know, establishing that IEP for the services that that student wants in that transition plan. So, you know, what's their employment goal? What's their, you know, independent living goal or any other pieces that you're putting in the IEP? Can MRS assist with that, that plan? And so then we can align your IEP with the IPE, the Individualized Plan for Employment with MRS, to make sure that we're aligning them. So the services that the student is obtaining is going to help with the IEP and then also to the IEP. EP with being successful. That's one of the biggest like confusing things ever um, when we're talking about it. It seems like, can we like make some different acronyms versus, you know, having the same ones and just, you know, alternating them? This is Caitlin. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. Does MRS assist DHH students with obca obtaining funding for attending college. Frequently, my students' families make statements about not being able to afford college for their DHH child. Yeah, so um, this is Jennifer. That's a really good question. So remember, everything is going to be individualized when we are looking for the services. One of MRS's goals is to increase that post-secondary outcomes for our students, making sure that they can be successful. So when we're looking at college, we want to make sure, you know, what is those skills and capabilities of that individual going to college? So even if, you know, they're deaf and hard of hearing, you know, we also are going to look at what is, you know, their capabilities of being successful in college? What are some, maybe some other opportunities that they, you know, may have? But it's not a no, they, you know, we're not going to support. So there's those things that we are going to look at. We do have assistance with college tuition. If that is something that the student um, qualifies for and if they, you know, can be successful in that college setting. So again, it's, you know, there's going to be those um, those assessments that we are going to do to make sure that they can be successful because we don't want to set up for failure. We want them, you know, to, to get the skills that they need and to be successful. So if you have a student that hasn't um, received pre-ETS in that early um, time frame, um, you can, you know, apply for the VR services and then you can get those services um, going through the application, meeting with that VR counselor and so forth to, to see what that eligibility is and, and move forward that way. And also um, MRS can assist with any accommodations that are needed in the educational process when they are preparing for a job. So that if there are some barriers there will work with the educational facility, the college or the vocational training program to make sure that the students get necessary accommodations. This is Caitlin speaking again. I don't see any more questions coming in. Thank you. So this um, this next slide is, um, as it was stated, you will be getting a copy of this. So you can um, contact Claudette or myself um, if you have any additional questions, maybe that we haven't, you know, answered, um, and you just want to have, you know, a little a chat, a little bit more. Um, we are open to that. Um, I, again, remember I, you know, I'm connected to our counselors. I'm connected to our site managers and, and district managers to help, to help support them and also you if needed. So my email is on there. And then two, um, if you are unsure where your, you know, closest office is or her, who your contact is, you can go to the michigan.gov and then um, backslash MRS, I wish we had that on there. And um, and there's an office locator. So what I will do is um, I will get that real quick and I will put that in our chat 
so you can have that saved if um, so you can know who to contact. Uh, this is John speaking, uh, John signing. I have one more question. Um, I'll go ahead and read this question here. It says, does MRS continue work with and to continue to work with and support their students until employment, until they have that successful um, attainment of employment? How does that work? Um, perfect question. So this is Jennifer. So once that student or individual, because even though we're starting working at age 14 and we're talking about students, just remember, like we, you know, work with individuals all the way up until, you know, um, however old they are. So like sometimes our famous thing is, is, you know, we might provide services to students when they're in school. They're like, no, we're good, or they're, you know, not motivated or stuff like that. Um, they can come back, you know, age 30, 35, you know, and, you know, and we see that and that there's nothing wrong with that. So keep that also too in mind when we're talking about that. But then also too, the goal is once they obtain that employment, we do have a um, a clock that starts ticking in our system, but really what it means is we're going to be with them up until 90 days of their successful employment. So it's that follow along and working with that individual, making sure that they're stable in their employment setting, providing, you know, what are some services that they need to learn the job? Um, you know, what, making sure that their assistive technology is set up, if that's something that they need, um, their office is set up, whatever might need that individual needs, we still provide services to make sure that they're successful. So like once they get employed, we're not going to close their case on day one. There is that, um, there's things that our counselors do afterwards to help them maintain that employment. And then sometimes, you know, hiccups that come up along the way, they may quit their job or there might be like the manager or their boss might be like, oh, I don't know if this is a good fit. Um, we can always step in and also to assist with that as needed. So it just depends on the individual, but we do not close their case day one of employment. Okay. Thank you for that. This is John speaking. Is there any more questions? Uh, don't be shy. We're not a shy group of people. Uh, but again, if you don't think of any questions, that's totally fine. We have the contact information on screen. If you would prefer to reach out directly, feel free to do that. So before we move on, I just wanna make sure, double check. Is there any more questions? Hey, John, this is Jennifer. In in the chat and everybody else, I did put our um, direct link for the office locator and um, Claudette did put our MRS um, link in there also. So there's two different links in the chat that you can um, copy and paste and keep them, you know, um, for your resources if you, you know, um, have any questions in there and want to explore our website. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. This is John. Any more questions? All right. Well, I want to thank you, Jennifer and Claudette, for your time. Thank you for that. And we're going to move on thank to the you. next slide. We're going to share some resources regarding transition within deaf and hard of hearing. So feel free to stay or take off, that's fine. But I wanted to share some more resources with everyone that is related specific to transition and DHH. All right, so the next few slides here, we're gonna list a few different resources and there's links on here. So you can take advantage of that and use that with your students. I'll try my best because uh, what I did, I put the links up here. Um, I have the websites pulled up, so I'm trying to move some things around here. But just so you know, we do have a Word document that has the same information, those same links, which we will be sending out once the recording is ready 
to be shared, we will add that. So whoever registered for this webinar will be receiving that information. You'll be getting that recording and you will also get an uh, attachment of a Word document that contains those links and resources. Excellent, so I'll try my best. I'll probably try to put that in the chat if it's possible. Uh, my apologies. Caitlin, I'm not sure if you have access to that, but in the in our SharePoint, um, I don't know if you're able to pull that up in front of you, but if not, that's no big deal, that's all right. Okay, so what you're seeing right here is you have Map It. Uh, it is a free module there that's related to job exploration. Then there's the Minnesota Transition, DHH Resources for Teachers, and the National Deaf Center. And the National Deaf Center is an incredible resource. It's rich of information as far as post high school goes. And Okay, now I can, there we go. Can everyone see this? Can everyone see my website here, my page? Oh, thumbs up, can I get thumbs up for everybody? Thumbs up, everyone can see this, shared screen. Okay, great, I got a thumbs up. All right, so Map It, that is a module that is free. You can download it. There's over 400 pages contained in here. It's an incredible resource with the self-assessment, there's free interactive training uh, for transition age students who are deaf and hard of hearing, a great resource. Um, who am I? What do I want? How do I get there? Uh, that type of career exploration. This is a resource that is very helpful. And you'll notice that the media program that they have here, the DCMP, the description and the captioning there, you see that they have uh, when you open up the videos, they have the captioning relating to your classes and your gen ed and access, what that's like uh, for their engagement as far as their lessons and having that information of how to do those things. All right. So this is the Minnesota resource that I had mentioned for teachers who teach deaf and hard of hearing children regarding transition. So this is Minnesota Transition. It's an incredible resource. There's a lot of information in here. And what I had mentioned to you, the National Deaf Center, this has an incredible rich amount of information and resources related to heart, deaf and hard of hearing topics. And transition. There's a variety of topics that expand on um, creats. There's a guide that uh, there's two presenters that talk. We know that there are two presenters talked about creats. There's a resource here. There's a guide. There's tools. There's a checklist. There's VR professional toolkit for those uh, who may not be familiar with the DHH population of students. There's resources here. Educational tools. And then, okay. Then NTECT. So NTECT, that's another resource. And that is a federal, um, a fe federal priority there. So that is housed under there. So all disability resources rel relating to transition. So it covers all disabilities, not just deaf and hard of hearing. So the National Deaf Center is more of a cohort, so, so to speak. Um, they are the, uh, I would say the lighthouse for the deaf and hard of hearing group as far as that information goes. It's ta worth taking a look at uh, to get some general ideas as far as your students, if they have other uh, their disabilities in addition to their deaf and hard of hearing, this is a great resource to look at the NTAC because it covers all disabilities. And they have a toolkit here that's available on the website. You'd have to log in. There's a variety of assessments that are located in here. Then also from Phonak, say a student wants to know, 
as far as their identity, right? In relation to being hard of hearing or deaf and hard of hearing. There's some information on here. Also, we have what's called the Casey Life Skills Toolkit. That is a resource here um, for daily living, self-care, activities, skills, assessments, how to teach, all that information is located in this toolkit. Okay, that's not it. Let me refresh. Oh, here we go. Uh, this is from the National Deaf Center. This is Deafverse. So what this is, it's incredible. This is a immersive signed a website and they have captioning, but it's talking about self-exploration. Oh shoot, you have to sign in, but you get the idea of what this looks like. So a student can register and this is free again. Uh, it's accessible, it's done in American Sign Language. There's captioning and spoken English. So it's more of a game that's interactive like that. We know that kids right now are very into uh, video games. So this is a great way. Uh, to speak to that audience. It's designed that way to make it more uh, engaging. That's pretty neat. All right, the 411 on disability disclosure. This is a workbook for youth who have disabilities. So self-determination, disclosure, pros and cons, accommodations, rights and responsibilities under the law. Just a, it's an additional resource here. And this is a website called I'm Determined. I'm Determined. So it's how students are involved, how they can become more engaged within the IEP uh, process when it's age appropriate to be able to take the lead on their IEP, of course, with guidance and if it's age appropriate, this is a resource uh, that will suggest how to coordinate that type of environment. All right, I'm sorry about that. Let's go to a different one here. Oh, here we go. So Deaf Tech, this is from NTID, RIT. This is a resource for high school and community colleges who teach deaf and hard of hearing in STEM related fields and programs. And then JAN, the Job Accommodation Network in relation to deaf and hard of hearing, even though the website uses the term hearing impaired. That's just an additional resource to consider. Also, from the similar previous mentioned, the Map It, this is the that website, the DCMP. They also have uh, a web page relating to getting a job and uh, how to a module about self assessments and different lessons to teach as well. This is on this website, and then of course uh, from MDELIO, our website. We have the secondary uh, transition guide for those who identify as deaf, deaf and hard of hearing. And these are tools for discussion during the uh, pre-ETS and post-secondary, whether it's high school planning. There's a variety of profiles. There's seventh grade all the way to post-secondary. There's columns that are contained in here in different areas that are specific, say, by this time, will you need to consider X, Y, and Z? So it lays it out nicely. And then we have an assessment resource guide. And this also includes transition-related assessments. You can take a look at this. Okay, now going back to the PowerPoint. Oh, time flies. Okay. So I wanna get uh, update you on some upcoming MDELIO events. I'm gonna have to rush a little bit here, but just so you know, Camp T 
is having their 50th anniversary open house celebration. Um, believe it or not, uh, since 1974, it's been 15 year, 50 years, we now can celebrate the um, inauguration of Camp T. Uh, we celebrated last month and we have two month, two more open houses. One of them is Sunday, May 19th, one to three, and then Saturday, July 13th, six to eight. Uh, please spread the word. You are all are welcome to join. Then the sleepover at Camp T. This is an incredible camp. Uh, this will be the first time that they're going to be hosting this for the older kids from sixth grade to high school seniors. Registration is $5. It's an overnight event. Interpreters will be provided. There's going to be a variety of fun activities available for the kids, archery, climbing tower, and more. And then we have Camp T Little Explorers Playgroup. And that's April 13th May and May 11th. Uh, please spread the word, share this with families, and including it includes a light lunch as well. It's just for a day, that 10 to 12. Then we're going to have Family Day at Michigan History Museum. And that is in, located in Lansing. That is Sunday, May 5th, 12 to 3.30. Lunch is included. Please share this. Share this with your families. Then we have professional development opportunities, educational interpreter workshops. We have one coming April 27th, 2024. Uh, registration closes April 10th. If you work with educational interpreters, please share this information with them. And I wanna say thank you for joining us today. I'm the only one here, my colleagues and my boss are already out uh, for a conference right now. So um, thank you for coming out. Uh, before you leave, I wanted to share a survey. So let me submit that here. So this is what the survey is going to look at, look like. So please fill this out. And I believe that is, the, I have a link for that, right? Caitlin, I'm sorry if I don't have a link for that. This is, <clears throat> this is Johanna. I think it's going to appear automatically when right, you, when you close off. the meeting. Yes, that's correct. Yes, so I realized that as I said it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please, when you exit the meeting, that's going to pop up that survey. It'll take just a couple of minutes, not even, not even that. There's only three questions. All your feedback is uh, helpful. And thank you for joining. Have a wonderful day.